Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have another great Campus Tap webinar today with um, Jennifer Fonseca from Palm Beach Atlantic University. We are very much looking forward to today's webinar. And um, feel free to post any questions or comments you may have in the right hand side of the screen. Um, you can pose questions to let everyone know. We will be taking questions um, live throughout the webinar. Um, and addressing them as they come along. So please, please feel free to pose those. Um, without further ado, we're just gonna do a brief introduction to our lovely guest today, um, Jennifer Fonseca, and then we will get um, right into the content. Uh, so today, again, yeah, we have cultivating connections and mentoring relationships. So we're really gonna be focusing on um, what you need to do to make sure you're building really strong connections that lead to a successful mentor relationship. Um, and something that's really going to help students and alums um, collectively really find the right careers and things like that that they're looking for. Um, so to run through a quick agenda, um, as I mentioned, we will have some brief introductions, um, especially introducing our guest, uh, Jennifer Fonseca. Um, we'll discuss kind of our joint mentoring missions, both um, Jennifer's experience and kind of the Campus TAP mission and goals overall through mentoring. We will discuss the elements of a beneficial mentoring relationship, as well as strategies to identify values, beliefs, um, and your personal professional interests. We will leave some time again at the end for uh, a Q&A, but uh, as we mentioned, please feel free to, please feel free to uh, post questions as we go um, throughout. Um, both Jennifer and I will be monitoring that um, and address those as we go. So without further ado, meet our great guest today, um, Jennifer Fonseca, who is the Assistant Director of Career Development at Palm Beach Atlantic University, as well as the Destiny Activator. Uh, I think in a moment we're going to have to ask um, Jennifer to get into a little bit more detail of what a Destiny Activator is and, and what that entails. But um, she holds this role while also managing her private coaching practice. Um, regardless of her job, job title, or employer, the core of who she is is one who stimulates and sets in motion purpose and in calling in individuals. Um, she has over 20 years of experience working in higher education at both private and public institutions, and she finds herself at home in career development. Uh, Jennifer is also on the board of the Florida Association of Colleges and Employers, uh, is a requested speaker at state, national, and inter international conferences and events. Um, and her true passion lies in launching students into successful and engaged careers. Um, she earned her MED at the University of Toledo um, after reading and embracing What Color Is Your Parachute? and her BS in journalism slash public relations at Bowling Green State University. So welcome, Jennifer. We are really happy to have you here today. Um, so yeah, while I just gave a brief uh, intro to you, love to hear a little bit more from yourself and a little bit more about your um, your personal your personal experience and your role at um, Palm Beach Atlantic University. Thanks, Ethan. Well, um, I'm very happy to be joining Campus Tap, and welcome to all the viewers. Uh, I so my career actually started once I graduated with my college degree. I did what every good college graduate does and I was a coffee barista for a little while while trying to figure things out but figured I missed the college campus so I've actually been in residence life I have been in academic advising and now I'm in career development and as you stated so aptly um, I have what I call a purpose title so that's my destiny activator that's probably for another webinar but I strongly suggest that everyone has a purpose title so that regardless of whether or not um, outside of like the box of just our job or our job title, like my job title tells you two things, right? It tells you my rank in the, and the office that I work within. But a purpose title is who I am all of the time. So I strongly suggest everybody gets a, a purpose title. And I've certainly been able to find it here or, um, you know, I activate Destiny even if I'm at Publix, which is actually, that's our supermarket here in South Florida. And that's actually where I met my husband, so. <laughs> Kind of a fun fact. But I do uh, run a mentoring program here at PVA, which I absolutely love. Yeah, and that is what we are going to dive right into right now. So first of all, kind of starting off, um, kind of discussing both ends of our experience, in, in, you know, in mentoring. Um, obviously, we'd really love to hear things from the higher ed perspective and, and um, learn a little bit about um, the physical mentoring program you have at Palm Beach Atlantic University. 
Um, so um, yeah, I will I will hand the floor over to you, let you give the folks a little bit more um, detail into that program, and then we can talk a little bit about um, a little bit about Campus Tap. So I will um, bring up bring up that other slide here for that as well. Okay, so I thought it'd be helpful to explain a little bit about why we started a mentoring program. And so the first component is that our university was really starting to talk about we're a small um, private Christian liberal arts university and vocational discernment um, in the broader context. So not in terms of um, the Catholic context of going into like the priesthood, but in the broader context of, you know, what is one's purpose or calling towards a career we were really exploring that and trying to find ways to be able to cultivate that amongst our students to help them to identify opportunities, whether they were through service opportunities or other opportunities. In the process of uh, that being a, a conversation on our campus, we applied for a grant through the Coalition of um, independent colleges, and it was the NetView grant, which stands for Network for Vocational Undergraduate Exploration. We got the grant, I was put on a committee, and at the same time, our dean, Dr. Leslie Turner of our Rinker School of Business, wanted to start a mentoring program for his students. The grant that we had written said I was to start a portal which didn't sound that exciting to me, but a program, a mentoring program specifically sounded a lot more exciting. And because I had someone to partner with, that was extremely helpful in the success of our program, launching our program, and maintaining and sustaining this program. So I strongly suggest finding someone good to partner with on your campus or at your organization. We did start off very small, I will say, that when I did some research in terms of what made mentoring programs really great, and I did look, Ethan, at, um, I looked at businesses and organizations, I looked at um, institutions of higher education, I looked wherever I could find information on mentoring programs. And when it came to programs at university, Xavier University has a great program, they're located in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I modeled some of our things, but uh, something repetitive that I kept hearing over and over again was start small and make it really good. So we did, we started with 15 students. We doubled in our second year and we're now in year four and we've maintained at 30 students or 30 mentoring pairs, which for us has been um, really good. We'd love to expand it. I would love for it to be a lot larger but first I need to ensure the success of the matches and the outcomes before we can take it to that next level. And um, Jennifer, uh, I just quickly wanted to jump in and ask, um, Absolutely. The, the, the students that you initially started um, with, with the mentoring program, did they have to meet any specific um, academic requirements or were they in a specific program um, at the university or, um, you know, over, yes. not, not overly, but were they um, meeting any different criteria to, to enter into the initial program? Yes, and that is a great question, Ethan. So we required on what we, we call our students protégés in the program. So our protégés needed to be either a junior or a senior. They needed to be in the Rinker School of Business. And we wanted them to have a GPA of at least a 2.5 and we put them through an application process. So they did have to fill out a profile, but it was also an application where we wanted to really see what their commitment would be to the program because we do require more than just meeting with the mentors. Now on the mentor side, we also had a set of criteria in our first couple. We still have criteria, we've changed our criteria. So our first couple of years, the criteria for the mentors were they needed to be in their career at least five years. So five years out of graduation, like an undergraduate graduation. Uh, graduation, And then they needed to enjoy what they do. They needed to be an alumni specifically, not just of our university, but of our school of business. Okay. And they needed to be local. We wanted our, the way our program is set up is we wanted it to be face to face. And I know other programs are a little bit different than that. The other, so those are the criteria for the protégés and for the mentors. But in terms of um, program structure, because this might help provide context also, we, our program isn't a one-off 
meeting or you know collect a set of advisors we really wanted to be intentional with having at least eight touch points throughout an academic year so the protégés and the mentors meet face to face once per month and then our protégés meet once per month with Dr. Turner and myself for what we're calling we need a we need a sexier name but we're for right now it's called protégé professional development meetings okay and we either do a common read we'll do um, an interest or personality assessment with the students. We'll bring in speakers like an HR panel to talk about interviewing job skills. It's just a value added component, but the student has to agree that they will meet once a month face to face. They'll come to those meetings and they'll come to both the opening and closing receptions. Excellent. Now, um, didn't want to give away too much of what we'll kind of cover cover okay. moving into next. So, um, so yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more um, around the the philosophy of the program, um, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about. Um, obviously, we're going with the physical program here, and then we can talk about kind of just the philosophies um, that we have at Campus Tap and how um, sure. some findings and things from research really really drove a lot of that. So, um, so here we go with uh, talking a little bit more about the philosophy at. Palm Beach Atlantic. Okay, so I have copyrighted this, but um, part of it, it, it was starting to come about just through the culture of our office in particular, but we have a, what we call who before do philosophy, which means figure out who you are before deciding what you're going to do. So somewhere between, you know, age, you know, five and six, when people ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then the time that you get to college, now it's, so what are you majoring in and what are you gonna do with your life? We've switched from asking people who they're gonna be to what they're gonna do. So we're trying to sort of flip the script and help students to really identify, especially in five key areas, who they are. And we're really starting to see how this plays well into making matches within our mentoring program. So before we get to that part, the five areas that we look at in particular, and you know, this is pretty common, is um, we call them our five Ps. So it's passion, then purpose, personality, proficiencies, and profit centers. So passion is not just um, where you get your energy or what makes you feel alive inside, but it's also the thing that you would endure through. So if you've ever read um, Grit by Angela Duckworth or watched her TED Talk, she talks a lot about passion and purpose. And with purpose, we look at who, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? Um, and who gets to benefit from that? Because somebody has to benefit on the other side of, um, you know, if it's just something you're excited about, but it doesn't benefit any, anybody else, it's probably not necessarily a wise career option. Personality, we look at things like the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, the strong interest inventory, any kind of personality assessment to identify a student's preferences or a mentor's preferences. Proficiencies are one's motivated skills. So I'm good at it and I love using it. Mm -hmm. And then profit centers, those are values, the things that are keenly important to you to the core of who you are. And we found that um, this is helpful not only for students being able to identify um, wise vocational opportunities, but also in doing the matching and finding a successful mentor-protege match. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, and folks, anytime you uh, do have any questions um, regarding anything that we are discussing here, uh, please feel free to jump in um, and discuss those on the uh, the chat box on the right. Um, so moving moving on with things. So you know, ap after hearing a bit about um, Jennifer's program and her experience with mentoring, um, you know, that was really one of the reasons why we wanted to partner with Jennifer on this program was because um, for Campus Tap, um, our mentoring approach um, and philosophy and what's really um, gone into the um, features and technology of our platform is really based on um, a lot of research that we did back in February of 2016 um, before we released the um, second iteration of our web platform um, and then our, our, our mobile platform um, was a partnership with a research um, user-centered design research called The Meme. Uh, it's based in Cambridge. Um, and what they did was really help us find a lot about um, the behaviors and motivations and, um, you know, just the different um, concepts around mentoring and how 
both mentees and mentors, um, in, in Jennifer's case, the protégés and the mentors approach those types of relationships. Um, so they did about uh, 500 user surveys with, with users that we had, and that led to um, a lot of in-depth, a lot of in-depth interviews. Uh, I think about over three hours uh, a piece for each interview, uh, and that really defined the the features and how we. Um, you know, develop the platform and how it's structured. Um, so really, you know, what our mission is, it's to empower individuals at any stage of their education. So, you know, current students, we also um, have alumni on the platform as well as faculty and staff. So to really empower any of them to um, make connections with like-minded individuals who can help them find fulfilling and passion-based careers, um, you know, or different things along the way in their career as everyone, you know, has a different different career journey. And that's one of the reasons why we really wanted to partner with Jennifer on this was because, um, you know, it really starts with that personality um, and those personal interests. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about mentoring and we think it's a great idea to pair a student who is in a specific major um, with, a, with an alum who is also a graduate within that major um, or, you know, someone who works at a company that fills that career interest. Um, but, you know, those 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 interests and things like that uh, evolve so much throughout, you know, a student's career in, in at their college university um, and evolves so much, you know, after that within that career. So um, we found a lot of really cool anecdotes and things like that that really showed that the best connections are really formed, um, you know, when people have that kind of initial personal buildup and connection. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, moving on down the line. So um, that kind of leads in right next to right into our, uh, our next point, which is, you know, really what makes um, really what elements drive a, a successful mentoring relationship. Um, so with that, we will kick that back over uh, to Jennifer to discuss a little bit more uh, about her program, uh, and we will be able to get right into a, a few more slides here. And again, folks, um, I know it's been a little bit quiet now, but please feel free to jump in with questions. Um, you know, we'd love to hear from you uh, and make sure that you're getting getting what you came here for today as well. Yes, I agree. Ask those questions. Because <laughs> um, I asked a lot of questions before we started our program, and we are still learning, and we have some flops that I can share with you. On some of these um, slides, I have three icons so that you can kind of see. Uh, we looked at some dividing it between here's how we identified good matching pairs, here's how we're training once they're paired and matched, and then training before the relationship really solidifies and begins. And then the coaching is the along the way component. So that's what that is. So we can go ahead and move to the next slide, Ethan. Okay. So. Um, you know, I said we have this who before do philosophy, which we do. We didn't employ it right away. So when we created an application profile for our protégés, we asked them the standard questions and we just used our heads in doing the matching. So we said, we asked, what is your major? What is your career goal? And then we tried to match it exactly with these are people and occupations that match that. And what we found is we had a few flops. So we needed to course correct. So you can see on this slide, we have a protege and a mentor, and that's how we match them based on them saying basically the same thing in terms of career. And we didn't really take a lot, we didn't put a lot of thought into, well, how did they tick? What's their personality? What would make for a really good match? We also hand matched the first year. So I, I really encourage individuals um, start small, make it well, and it doesn't, we're a two person office at our university. And I really, I had very limited resources. We had some money from the grant, but I was also sharing that grant money with other parts of the campus. So we started with very little resources in terms of time, in terms of people, and in terms of finances but we were able to do it and we were able to grow it. And so our first year, we, like I said, we hand matched based off of profiles that were completed that asked very basic information. Um, we found that we had a couple of flops and that were one I would say was because we weren't taking into account personality, uh, cultural differences. So we had, for example, we had one student from the Caribbean, and then we had another student who was from Kenya, and both of their matches did not work out that well. And 
I believe it in with our student from Kenya, he's definitely an extrovert, talks a lot. You can hear him a mile away, literally. And that's sort of his personality larger than life. And he kept telling us, my mentor's not responding. He's not saying anything to me. But the mentor was saying the same thing. He was saying, the student is not communicating with me. The student isn't responding. And I think part of that was based on personality and preferences. And they were matched, again, just based off of general profile information, not asking enough specific questions to see would their personalities be a good, good mesh. What we did find in our first year is the matches that were successful were the ones where they did have a better personality match. So for example, we had, um, he's a vice president with USB. His name is Steve, he was our mentor, and we matched him with Troy. And Troy's uh, big dilemma was, I'm an accounting major and I really enjoy it. But Troy also really enjoyed ministry. That was part of his personality and his value system. And the person that we matched him with was bivocational. So during the work week, he was a vice president at a financial firm. But during the weekend, he was a pastor. What we also found out is, and we didn't know this in advance, is that Troy and Steve were both from the same area. Mm -hmm. Their families had mutual friends, which they didn't know until they started meeting and exchanging information. And even though they were matched four years ago, they're still connected to one another. So they're, Troy has already graduated. He no longer is a student at the university. And four years later, they're still in a mentoring relationship. And it wasn't because we had matched them well, it's really because by happen chance, their personalities, their value systems, the core of who they are really matched well. So we learned from that. We learned from, okay, these were flops and these were successes, so how do we adapt things? So what we did is we didn't learn super quickly. So year two, we still did hand matching. Okay. It took us four to eight hours. We. Um, in looking at getting software, it was cost prohibitive and you need 50 matches is kind of the minimum what we found with comparing. Um, and we didn't have 50 matches yet. Yep. So what we decided in year three was we need to collect better information, both from the protégés and from the mentors. So we adjusted their profiles to include things like um, what are hobbies, what are interests that you have outside of the academic realm, outside of your work, what are things that you are looking for in a protege. So we changed our question strategy to make better matches. But we also, in our initial meeting, we did a speed meeting exercise. So if you've ever done speed dating, I have not, but <laughs> I researched it. We did a speed meeting exercise for students and the mentors to get to know one another and see do our personalities connect on that level. So instead of just using our heart or our head, I'm sorry, and making, you know, based off of profile descriptions, we started using our heart as well. So you can see these are some pictures from our speed meeting. And we found that there are two really crucial components to making successful matches. You need chemistry and you need connection. And the third year of our program, so we're now in our fourth year, but the third year of our program, our protégés went through the speed meeting exercise, meeting all the mentors and they wrote down their top three choices. So they were able to read the profiles in advance, but in meeting face-to-face -face with the mentors, they were able to really see, is this somebody I would click with? And so they would list their top three. And what we found is that oftentimes, well, I had a student, Harrison, for example, he read all the profiles of the mentors in advance and he ranked them on an Excel spreadsheet and came up with like his top, you know, three to five people that he was interested in. His list changed after he went through the speed meeting exercise because he was connecting with people face to face and getting to know who they were. Now, the thing that we did in the speed meeting in year four, so this was this past fall, to change things up a little bit, we took feedback from our mentors and we made two major changes. The first was they, and I see the question coming up and so I'll address that. The first 
um, change that we made is in the speed meeting, the conversation could not be about work, about school. So we had a list of questions that the students had to, um, the students and the mentors would answer. Like, um, I've got another slide that has that. I don't know if it's time for it yet, but um, there were things like, if you were to make a how-to video on YouTube, what would it be about? Mm -hmm. So we gave question prompts and we really wanted them to get away from talking about work and school, which would be the norm, and really start talking about who they were as an individual, those five Ps, their, what they're passionate about, what their purpose is, what their proficiencies are, what their personality is, and what their profit centers, their values. Um, and then the um, second change based off of our mentor feedback is the mentors also selected their top three. So the protege okay. said, here are my top three, and the mentor said, here are my top three, and then they were matched based off of that. And so let me read that. So the question is for the speed meeting, did they meet with all the mentors, proteges, or just the ones in their fields? Nope, they met with everybody. And I gave them the option. So I asked the students, do you want to do the speed meeting where, because we have a pretty clear delineation. Um, there's really three groups of, of students. We have a group that are finance and accounting. We have another group that's marketing and another group that they're a little more entrepreneurial. So this isn't by major, this is by really area, the protege is by areas of interest. And we asked them, do you want to only meet just the, do you want, those of you who are entrepreneurs, do you just want to meet the entrepreneur mentors that have signed up for the program? And they all said, nope, we want to meet everybody. So as many as the mentors that could come to our opening reception, everybody met everybody. Okay. Okay. And then for those that couldn't be there, actually, this was a third change. We asked the mentors to submit a three minute video. And in it, we asked them to specifically address these things, who they were and where they worked, what they're looking for in a protege and a little bit about their personal, like their lifestyle, their, um, their personal interests, their hobbies, things like that. So not about all the work stuff, um, just about them, what they're looking for in a protege. So we were really trying to get that chemistry and connection match not and stay away from trying to do what seems really logical but doesn't always work out. Yeah, and um, I don't know, I don't know if anything we'll get into in a minute, but um, also a question that I had based on that is, you know, after, your, after those initial um, matches are made, um, you know, obviously you mentioned you do have meetings with the um, – with the proteges in the program to kind of talk about their professional development and, and just their relationships in, in general. But, um, you know, what, what do you do in working with the mentors to really make sure um, they're continuing to play an active role? And, um, you know, how much how much influence do you continue to have throughout the, the relationship that they're having um, to make sure that it's going well? That's a great question. And we're still working on that component. So. We, Dr. Turner and myself, so he's again the dean of our school of business, we solicited, um, we, we sent out, he sent out an email to all the graduates of both our MBA program and our undergraduate business programs who live within a 30 mile radius, basically within our county, within Palm Beach County and just you know, said who might be interested in. And then we've also, our protégés suggested they wanted to meet people, they wanted mentors, they didn't care if they came from our university or not. They just wanted somebody to speak into their life and believe in their dreams and help them to reach them. So we reached out through personal contacts, LinkedIn, you know, all these different methods. So I think on the front end, we had more, more of a personal connection or more. Or some of it was by referral. So we knew that they would be better mentors to begin with. Mm -hmm. They had that natural coaching ability. And we do, um, I'll talk a little bit later on in the webinar, but we do have a manual. We also changed up the beginning part of our opening, our speed meeting. We did a very quick training with the mentors, you know, helping to address these proteges, they're people, not projects. Ask more questions than you give advice, like basic listening skills to try and train them. And then we touch base with them. We found um, for us, we try and not over communicate. So we're trying once a month to send out an email to the mentors and just say, hey, how is it going? You know, 
just trying to solicit feedback from them and see, is there anything that we can do to help facilitate, you know, a great relationship? But that is a component that we're still trying to work on a bit. Yeah, and it's very interesting. And, um, you know, bouncing off of um, bouncing off of some of the things you're describing with the program, um, again, just brings to the point that um, to really have to have a successful relationship, it really does start with the personal side. And uh, we found it through a different way, you know, with doing a lot of research up front. Um, obviously, we had uh, the ability to have the resources available to us to kind of do um, such an in-depth, in-depth study like that. But, you know, as I mentioned, I kind of went into earlier the amount of people that we surveyed. Um, so they were people who were actually campus tech users of the Canvas Tap platform already. Um, so surveyed roughly 500 people. Um, and from there, um, we did these in-depth in in -depth interviews. Um, and, and a great thing that can kind of, um, you know, complement the fact that you do these events and the speed dating um, and programs like that to kind of launch the mentoring relationship is um, one of the great anecdotes we have. Um, and I should mention at this time that we will follow up as well with a lot of slot with with all of these slides, um, as well as the full case study that I'm kind of referencing here. So you'll all be able to read through that um, and get a lot of the findings from that directly. Um, I'm kind of just pulling a few of the the major themes here, um, but. One of the great anecdotes was from um, an upperclassman. This was in a uh, an engineering program. They were starting to do a mentoring program, um, and it was where an upperclassman were paced, were um, paired with lower classmen. Um, and there was one anecdote um, about a student who ended up connecting with another student, um, and ended up forming this really long-standing friendship um, after their mentoring relationship um, was kind of kicked off. Um, so that kind of really speaks to the fact that it's really good to start these things off in a personal setting where people have, actually have a chance to meet each other um, yes. up front. Um, obviously, you know, on, on our on, our, on the Campus Tap platform, um, you know, we, we have the opportunity to allow people to kind of People are people. It's it's a little bit different where people have the ability to you know just kind of make connections and message people and have conversations before they enter into a formal mentoring relationship. So that's you know kind of another yep. way or example of offering people the opportunity to kind of feel things out. Um, and one thing that we really really learned uh, about mentoring and the overall um, you know views on it is that. One of the one of the most difficult things for people entering into mentor relationships is the anxiety and the tension that comes with um, mm -hmm. yep. that initial outreach. Um, you know, we we have a, we we all benefit greatly, you know, from LinkedIn and things like that. But um, you know, especially for for students, you know, someone who may just be a freshman or sophomore in college, um, it's extremely intimidating to have to reach out to someone, you know, not knowing if they are really available to be involved in a mentoring relationship, um, or even if they would be interested. Um, and, you know, you may, you, you really have a lot of anxiety around that, um, around that initial outreach. And then beyond that initial outreach, you know, just the anxiety around whether this, is, whether you're able to, um, communicate in that relationship the right way. So, you know, that's where it really is important to be able to build those existing, um, you know, personal personal qualities. Um, so, you know, within the platform, people are able to filter um, and the profiles are really robust, you know, talking about people's interests and hobbies and things like that. Um, and you're able to connect and message with people. Uh, and it's really more about um, starting with entering into communities that you're involved with and then meeting people um, and making those connections from there. Uh, one of the biggest things that we learned from from all of this was that um, the the you know the views of mentoring overall have really shifted, and I think that's like very well exemplified within different programs, like the program that you're doing, Jennifer. Um, you know, it was like a very one to one professional. Um, professionally minded thing, um, but what we're seeing now is people are really approaching it in a very tactical way, you know, where if a student is is looking for um, an internship, you know, now they're able to, you know, go into, and it doesn't even have to be through a platform like Canvas Tap, but going into an alumni database and seeing the inter information that's available to them. I mean, you can use LinkedIn in that way as well. Uh, but, you know, make an initial outreach and just start a conversation. 
Um, and you never know that could lead into a long term um, mentoring relationship. So, you know, we really learned that, you know, the best way to really go into these things is to get to know each other, form an actual connection before you enter into this mentoring relationship uh, and then really come to the mutual understanding that you can both really benefit each other um, from having this respectful uh, mentoring relationship. Um, and, you know, a, a, another couple of the key things that we took away from this was that mentoring can really take a lot of different forms. You know, it can be long lasting, uh, a traditional format, um, but again, it can be very tactical um, and it can also be, you know, professional versus personal. Um, so, you know, there's very structured and defined programs um, with specific goals, but I think it's just good to really promote overall to students that, you know, mentoring isn't this intimidating thing that's going to help you, that you you'd necessarily need to do. I think it's really a, a good thing to really break down those barriers and, and find ways to approach it in a, um, you know, comfortable setting for, for a lot of people. Um, and it went on a bit of a, bit of a um, <clears throat> late, tangent there on how to few questions no, but it it's so funny i it, so um and i see the question coming up but so what's so funny is you're right ethan some of the students um would show up in our office and it was like they were going on a first date and not just a first date like the very first first mm. date and these were confident students coming in Males, I had two males. Um, one was very interested in the yachting industry. And he came into my office like four times saying, what do I do about this? And I, you know, sometimes it was for career direction. I said, well, that's a great question. You should ask your mentor. And then he'd get all frazzled like, well, how do I ask my mentor? And I'm thinking, you just asked. <laughs> you just, you yeah. know, that's what they're there for. So that's really funny. And, you know, another thing that um, you're sparking in me too is, some of our students, it's not like they swap mentors. So they're in a long-term, in our program, they're in a long-term, you know, one-year relationship, you know, a calendar year relationship with this, the, their mentor. But what's interesting is um, I have mentors who have been very gracious with their time. And so if another protege in the program is hearing about their career path and has questions, they have coffee and it's not their mentor. It's somebody else's mentor in the program, but they're sort of swapping and sharing a bit. So it's yeah. kind of like having their own personal advisory board. Like, yeah. And that, that's one of the um, big features that we, you know, included in the platform, you know, after this research study was the ability to have a personal advisory board. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're able to connect with as many people as you would like within the platform, you know, similar to like you do on, on LinkedIn and things like that. Um, and but then you're able to build your personal advisory board and speak to those people in different ways and you can format it where and structure it in any way you kind of want so if you are really entering into the into your you know spring semester of your junior year and starting to really approach um mm -hmm. the job search pretty heavily you know you can build a personal advisory board of people who are all within kind of the, ge the general industry that you're looking to um, move into and you can kind of post you can pose questions to individuals or the group collectively um, whereas on the other side you know if you are a, a mentor um, and you kind of want to work with a group of students and, and do things in a group setting you know and you're able to find that um, connection between all the, the students that you're working with um, you know you can set up group meetings and things like that with the advisory board and you can kind of structure things there and a lot of people are really moving in the direction of, of approaching it as mm -hmm. a personal advisory board um, sure. And I think that's a great, great way because it gets people um, overall just more involved. And, and a great, a couple of great questions here. I will jump, jump into those because, um, you know, we're, we're coming up on the um, 40 minute mark here and we want to make this a pretty um, efficient webinar. Um, so Stacy Griffin asked, what has been the interaction with students in your office because of the program? That's a great question. Um, if if intera office interaction has um, changed, you know, with, with the introduction of this program. That is a great question, Stacy. So, yep, it has increased. It, I would say it's increased the traffic, not just because they come in for things related directly to the mentoring program, but because our career development office has such an active role with the mentoring program. The students are coming in for, can you review my resume because my mentor is recommending me for an internship? Or, um, I know you've got these personality assessments and my mentor wants me to take Strengths Finder. So can I come in and take that? Absolutely. So we're seeing a lot of traffic as a result of that. Now, again, our program isn't huge, but I would say students that wouldn't necessarily come in 
um, because they don't have the relationship with our office, they are coming in. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And we have we got we have quite a few questions coming okay. in now, Jennifer. So um, we will get we will get through these, and then um, we can um, jump back into the um, regularly scheduled program and kind of get through the strategies to. Um, I'll talk really fast. Help people identify those values. No, no, take your time. But just want to let you, let everyone know how we'll kind of format that. We'll handle these questions, get into the last portion of the webinar, um, and then we can um, handle any questions um, at the at the end as well. So um, next up from Deborah Frank, we have um, you know what are your opinions. And what do you think of the term flash mentoring, Jennifer? I love all the mentoring. I think they all have their place and they're all useful. I'm one person in a two person office. So I'm and, and without the resources to buy a software program that allows for all the different types of mentoring. So I do like the flash mentoring for us uh, because of the vocational discernment, because of the grant. Those were reasons that we went with the more longer term mentoring program. But, you know, every day we're all, you know, many of us are career professionals. I'm connecting people with LinkedIn all the time to just do that quick flash mentor, you know, get an informational interview in. So I, whatever you can do and whatever fits your organizational culture, I say go for it. Yeah. And um, another question there from the Georgia Way is um, – most of most of their alumni live uh, live far away from their campus. Mm -hmm. So, um, what are some ways that you suggest building the personal connection virtually? Um, obviously, don't want to give too much of a plug of campus tap, you know, because that's not the purpose here. But um, you know, there are other. I know that I know of other strategies out there that you can do these things virtually as well. Um, but love to hear, you know, what um, what you think about that, and if you've explored any of those or or read up on any of those. We, we did a little bit. So our first year we had one match that um, they did either via phone or via Skype that worked really well. And there was a school that, um, I, it was a school out in California that I had talked with. And a lot of theirs were uh, like a long distance match, usually over Skype, because I, I'm, I'm remembering that they had a business person like in China, somewhere in Asia, um, and they were matched with this student and it looked like it was a su successful match. We just, we haven't had that many that are like that. Now we're testing it out next semester. I have two students that are doing a um, sort of like a gap semester. So they have an opportunity over in Europe to do something for this semester. It's not through our, our university, but they wanted to maintain their mentoring relationships. And so we asked that their mentors would be willing to do Skype or Google Hangout or FaceTime, whatever they wanna do, just keep meeting or keep touching base with one another to maintain the relationship and that was okay with us. So I'll let you know once we have that data, but you might have more, you, you could probably speak to that better than I could, Ethan. Yeah, I mean, I know I know if you're not, if you're not using a, um you know, kind of a full suite, you know, mentoring platform. And also, you know, within within Canvas Tap, it's like even within Canvas Tap, it's able to make those connections virtually um, on the platform. But if you're kind of looking to structure it um, more as like a, a, an event format, um, that's there's a great ways to do that too. Um, and I, I, w I don't know all the platforms off the top of my head um, that you'd be able to use, but um, I know the um, Alumni Career Services Network, they actually ran something kind of like this and i think they used um brazen i believe was the platform um but any sort of platform that's out there that allows you to kind of connect in these virtual communities and then um have private conversations in different um chat rooms within there um and like join different rooms those are great there's another platform that i've heard of um that people use for these types of things uh, and it's called shindig um, and that's another platform where you're able to kind of enter into different rooms for conversations so i think a great way to structure that is to you know if you have a great alumni um, base and you can really engage a lot of them you know get a get a good group together and you can format that or structure that either based on industry or you know major or you know whatever way you want to structure it within your specific program. Um, get a good group of alumni together, um, and then students can either join the different rooms, kind of in like it, kind of join different rooms for a panel discussion. Um, and then what they can also do is kind of message the alumni or the the potential mentors directly um, to create conversations offline, and they can really like build the mentor relationship from there. And the great thing about all these tools that are coming out now is the ability to track everything. So you yeah. know, you're able to, as an admin side, keep track of the, the engagement um, 
That's and a disadvantage one, we're at now. That is that we're not at the place where we can do that. It, hmm. But I'm I'm counting on a donor coming in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, that's 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 the thing. You know, there's ways to do all this stuff. Grassroots, there really are. You know, you can you can try to um, format it in different ways. I mean, it just, it takes a lot of extra groundwork and legwork. So, um, I know it's a bit of a, a bit of a, you know, time consuming effort, um, you know, building those things that way. Um, but then the last question we have here currently is, um, you know, directly for you, uh, Jennifer is, do you have to deal with varying responses from potential mentors or protégés, um, in parentheses, you know, concerning the number of applications from both sides, you know, and how do you deal with the difference before matching? So I think that's speaking more to, I think that's kind of speaking to, you know, if there are, um, you know, mentors or protégés who may not directly find that match at this, at these um, events before the program kicks off and, and the difference between, um, and any difference there. Well, this last year, what we found is a lot of our students gravitated toward the same three to four mentors. And I think that had to do more with age and personality, like how engaging somebody was, um, as opposed to what they actually did as a profession. Um, so because we asked each side to list their top three and we had more personal knowledge, especially of the protégés, there were some matches that we had to make where neither side actually requested the other. Um, so far, we have not heard any negative commentary back regarding those matches. We say, give it a try. Let's see if it works. And if it doesn't, then we try and rematch the individuals. But so far, we've, we've done pretty good. And we one of the other things that we do is um, we use Canvas as our you know online platform for courses and things. So we set up a, a course for our mentoring program and our students our protégés are required to write a just it's a paragraph like I, it doesn't it's not a number of words it's just a paragraph just to touch base and a reflection on you know how's the mentoring relationship going what are you learning so that's part of how we you know kind of figure out how's the match going excellent um, okay. awesome well thank you for all those questions everybody I mean that was that was a great um, you know mini Q&A session to kind of break things up there um, and now as we're kind of getting closer to the time um, mm -hmm. This is a good time to kind of jump back into, you know, we were talking a lot about the the idea of basing these um, mentor relationships off of the the personal connections, the values, um, interests, and things like that. So uh, now we're going to take some more time here to hear from Jennifer about, you know, strategies and exercises and things that you can do with, you know, not just students but the alums and the people who are serving as the mentors. Um, you know, what you can do to help them understand what their true values are and what they're really looking for. Um, so that way they know what they're looking for going into into the relationship, you know, and you're, you're able to really um, do a lot of stuff ahead of time to be able to lead to more success once, once that match is made. So um, we will toss that back to Jennifer. And again, um, feel free to post some more questions, everyone, and we will get to that um, as we close out the webinar. Great. So, we do, um, on the front end, there's a couple things. There's the profiles that we have adapted, and then there's um, the actual, some speed meeting things. One flop that we had, uh, but I learned a lot from the flop, is we had a student who was very interested in social entrepreneurship. We matched her with a mentor who, um, that's his business. He 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 does social entrepreneurship. We thought it'd be a great match, and it really didn't work out as we expected. Um, and part of that was, I think, if we would have done a different gender match, like this particular mentor would have preferred being matched with another male as opposed to female. But the protege, she ended up really connecting with another female at the organization. So that's where the her she got her actual mentoring from. Um, but it told us it was informative in the sense of, okay, so maybe we need to ask some different questions. Um, and I think um, it maybe switch to the next slide. That was our speed meeting. Okay. Those were the speed meeting questions. Well, people can see that. Those, those were the speed meeting questions that we asked that we said, do not talk about, you know, business or what your major is. These are some questions where you can identify more personality, values-based information to find out 
would you be a person that I click with? So we adapted our profiles and we wrote some different questions and we will adapt them again next year to ask some other questions. Um, so our next step in terms of adapting our profile questions so that what they're reading in advance of one another, um, there's two things that we'd like to do. One is having asking things like, um, how well does, and then fill in the blank, this describe you. So the fill in the blank might be, how well does the word clever describe you? Or how well does doing things according to a plan describe you? And they would answer kind of on a Likert scale between very well and not at all. Um, asking questions with how would your friends describe you, give them a list of 30 different adjectives and you can only pick four. Um, asking a question like, what are you thankful for? And name three things and justify why you're thankful for those things. These are the types of questions on a profile that I think will make for better matches in the future. It's like, you know, when you think about um, a person that you're dating or you're partnered with or even your workmates, it's like you click or you don't. And it's usually based off of personality preferences and your core value system. So if we can at the get go start establishing what are people's personality preferences, whether they take a MBTI assessment, a strengths finder assessment, or they answer some simple questions that help identify what their core values are, what their personality traits are, we think we'll get better answers so that in advance a student can say, this is who I anticipate I might click with. And then um, during the um, speed meeting, I I've used a different, um, I have a, I didn't make a picture of it because I actually just came up with this idea this morning. So, so we're going to process this together. But um, oftentimes we use um, a values card sort with students. Um, I've adapted it to be like how to pick the college you want to attend for prospective students. And it's a double ranking system that allows individuals to use both sides of their brain, meaning they identify the top 10 values that they that are important to them in whatever decision they're making. And then they look at all their options and they say, how congruent is this value with option number one? How congruent is it with option number two? How congruent is it with option number three? Um, and if you want, you can flip off of that slide, Ethan, and just you can put it back to me because maybe I can just hold this up in front of my okay. screen and people can see it. So let me see. Okay, so this is, <laughs> so I'm going to adapt this and I'm going to give it to my students um, and the mentors. So my student who made the Excel spreadsheet, he made a list, he made an Excel spreadsheet and he ranked the people based off of their profiles. And I thought, well, what if I create a list of what's important in the mentor that I seek out, whether it's gender, whether it's the industry that they're in, whether it's um, if they're a person of integrity, whatever their core, whatever an individual's uh, core values are what they want to be matched based on. And then they rank on a scale of one to 10, you know, how important is this value to me? So if I'm a female, which I am, and I want a female mentor, I can say on a scale of one to 10, having a female mentor is a five. Like, I don't care if my mentor is, is a male or a female, it's, I'm indifferent. And then I look at my options for all my mentors across the top or for the mentors would be the protégés. And I could say, okay, so how congruent is Ethan in terms of gender with me? Mm -hmm. Plus three. And so it's, it's a double ranking system that allows for both the feeling side of someone's brain and the very objective side of someone's brain. So that's another thing that we will institute if somebody would like to use it and objectify a little bit more, um, instead of doing like a pro-con list of well, do I want this mentor or this mentor or this protege or this protege? Something that will objectify the process a little bit. So those are some things that we're changing for next year in terms of both the, the profiles up front and the selection process to come down to these would be the top three people that I would I would hope to be matched with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you have to be able to find some way to kind of, you know, automate it 
in, yes. in, in, in automated in a manual way. Um, you need you need to be able to do uh, to do something to do something to kind of speed up the process because yes. um, you know actually it's it, an interesting personal example is you know you doing the the Big Brother Big Sister program something like that you know um, that's mm -hmm. all based on you know personal connections and and things like that and interests but that process takes about like two months to, to go through because, you know, they're doing everything uh, manually. There's in-depth interviews associated with it. You have to do both with both sides, you know, um, take into account um, different different match pairings and then present that to the other person and, and see where, see if there's really um, an interest there. So yeah, you need to find ways, to, you know, and do what you can to really automate that. Uh, yeah. And now I, I, I think you wanted to get into a bit of the, um, the, the manual and program that you have as well, Jennifer. So that's part of our training and coaching component is, um, and again, we modeled some of this off of various different programs, but Xavier's got a very well established large mentoring program. Um, and so in our, what we did is we provided a manual to both our protégés and to our mentors where we suggested activities that they could do because we found like if the, if the match, wasn't well done either on our part or their part they just didn't click personality they ran out of stuff to talk about um yeah. and and part of how we learned that what was interesting is in one of our um, last year our program we had hunter who was matched with nigiri so hunter is your typical you know white caucasian kid nigiri is from africa she's in the tech field hunter is a marketing guy he, I think, currently works for Facebook. And I'm thinking he's going to want to mentor that some superstar marketing person. Najiri's a total tech person. But what we found made them such a great match is they both love traveling the world. They both are high energy, extroverted, talk on top of one another types of people who can make decisions very quickly. And they had very, very similar value systems. They didn't meet once a month. They met like every week and they would meet for hours and not run out of things to talk about. And yet I had students who were saying, I don't know what to do next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in our manual, we created some opportunities and we said, OK, do a common read. Here are some books that we might suggest that you guys could read through. Here are a list of all of our campus activities from theater to athletics. Go to a game. I mean, if if business deals happen on the golf course, then why can't a mentoring relationship? You know, that's a great, that's a great analogy. That's a really good way to put that. Yeah. So, and it was funny because the students weren't thinking of these things. So we just collected where, where were things happening successfully and let's just keep replicating that. So we put in questions that they could ask activities that they could do with the full campus schedule, which is great because it promotes all the events at your university. Um, or at your organization, and that allowed, you know, that increased attendance. It's a win-win all the way around. So those were some things that we did. We also put in, you know, how to manage the relationship in terms of expectations. Here's another thing that uh, we instituted that was interesting is the mentors, they can fire, they can fire their protégés. If the protégé is not following through on following up, on communicating, on um, participating fully in the exercise, then the mentors can actually fire the student. And that's a great real world example. You yes. know, if you're not holding up your end of the bargain or doing your job, you know, you, you are going to be fired. Yep. Um, so that's great. And, and especially, you know, it, 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 it shows that, you know, when you're doing a program like that, that the, the mentor's time is really valued. Um, yeah. and that's, and that's really important because, you know, that's important because you want to set the standard that the people that are going to be involved in the mentoring program are really invested in that and, you know, invested just based on a, a, a genuine interest in giving back and helping out in that way. Um, and, and then, you know, holding them accountable, um, really, really make sure that the students really benefit or the protégés really benefit the most. Um, and we do have them both sign, both the mentor and the protégé sign an agreement where we outline the expectation and say, if this isn't who you can be and these are commitments you can't fulfill, then we're going to ask you to step out. And now a great question from uh, Kate Woodford is, can the protégés turn around and fire their mentors? We haven't said that, <laughs> <laughs> but we do have students that come and say, I'm not getting feedback, you know, and so we do our due diligence and kind of 
feel out the situation. Like, do we have the correct contact information? Does the mentor not have time like they thought they might? And we reassess. But at this point, um, protégés aren't firing the mentors, but they can definitely come to us and say, could I switch? And sometimes we say yes, and sometimes we say no. And we did have one student who we told him, no, you couldn't switch. Here's what we want you to try. Let's try this course correction with communicating and see what happens. And it turned out, it turned out very well. It was just a simple miscommunication. And now as, um, you know, I think, you know, as we're coming to the to the close of the webinar, you know, want to make sure we um, are able to answer, you know, some final questions. Jennifer, make sure you're able to, you know, make some final points that you'd like. I think what we learned from this webinar is we have a lot more um, to discuss, and I think we'll, we'll need to be doing some follow-up. Uh, you know, whether that comes in uh, another webinar or some other different forms, I think we'll definitely have to be uh, fleshing this out and exploring this a bit more. Um, so want to give you an opportunity, Jennifer, to provide any final thoughts and maybe, you know, share, um, share some things that you're going to be doing now that we're doing now that we're coming upon, or, you know, if you already have some plans for how you're looking to improve the program for, um, you know, next year, anything like that. Sure. I would say the, the bottom line is chemistry and connection. You, you need to have, need it's to have, not just a, just a major equals a career. Equals a career. We, we know that as career professionals, but, but helping, helping um, the, the protégés, protégés and the and mentors, the mentors. I'm, hearing I'm, hearing I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing an echo. There, I don't know if we can fix that. That's better. I think, I think we're back. Okay. okay. It, it's having that chemistry and chemistry component. component. And, and so for so us, the first section is going to be asking some additional questions on the flow files. And, and finding find some, some more face-to-face -face -face connection points, points during our speed during our meeting to really, to really be able to make, sure, able that to make sure that they can speed with the person and know whether or not they're making a connection. connection. So those would be the so things be the that we're just gonna, just gonna we're gonna course correct. Course correct. Well, we uh, really appreciate your time, Jennifer. Um, stick around for just a minute. Um, I wanted to provide an opportunity to share everyone, um, you know, just with a thank you note and con some contact information. Um, uh, Jennifer was was gracious enough to provide her email. So uh, as long as that's still out there, um, feel for, I think a few people were looking for that to, to make some connections and, and learn a little bit more. So I will share um, that right now to give you all um, that, her information. Um, as well as the Canvas tab information. So uh, also really would like to encourage people, um, if this is something that you are interested in, um, in you have an, a program at your institution that you'd like to discuss uh, with Canvas tab or for a webinar, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We are always open to um, hearing from you. Um, it doesn't always have to be us doing doing the outreach. Um, you know, Jennifer, uh, as a great example, you know, reached out to us and wanted to discuss um, the program and see how we could kind of work together. So um, feel free to, to follow her lead. Um, so yeah, you can find us at marketing at the um, and you can reach Jennifer at Jennifer underscore Fonseca at pba.edu. And that is going to be the close of our webinar today, everyone. We really appreciate you all for um, taking the time to join us. Um, Jennifer, again, thank you for, for taking the time as well. I'm um, gonna, gonna stop the broadcast here um, and uh, we will uh, just quickly catch up before, before we let you go. But um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, just to let you all know, we will actually be hosting another webinar um, next week um, with uh, Cal State University discussing some employer engagement initiatives um, that you can run within career services. Um, so feel free to look out for, for some more uh, communication coming there. Uh, feel free to check in with us at any time. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and um, thank you all and have a great rest of your week and enjoy the holiday season.